Okay, so we are talking about chapter three in um, our textbook, which is a review of thermodynamics, which for us we could really call bioenergetics. So we're looking at thermodynamic processes in living cells. So this is a little bit of a review of what you already know about thermodynamics. Um, and we are going to be seeing how these unfavorable, non-spontaneous processes are able to happen in our cells. How we couple those reactions, the types of molecules that we use um, to drive these unfavorable reactions. So in chapter one, we did an example and an overview of um, definitions of these different types of processes. We said that metabolism is the sum of all um, chemical reactions in our cells and we said there were two classes. There were catabolic reactions and there were anabolic reactions. We said that these catabolic reactions, they produce ATP. We're gonna see this is the molecule that we'll most currently use to transfer energy. And then these anabolic reactions, they require ATP. That means these catabolic reactions would have a delta G that was negative or less than zero. These anabolic reactions would have a delta G that was positive or greater than zero, meaning these are spontaneous. These do not require an input of energy to occur. These are non-spontaneous. Another word is unfavorable. So you'll hear non-spontaneous, spontaneous, unfavorable, favorable, all of those kind of used interchangeably they all mean the same thing. So this is just a really quick review of the type of thermodynamics that we are going to be using in biochemistry. So we'll talk first in the next chapter we'll talk about protein folding. Protein folding is a spontaneous process because the overall folded protein is going to have a lower free energy than the unfolded protein. So we'll see that all of these processes um, that we are going to cover, um, how the thermodynamics are going to come into play for each of those. So first let's just kind of review some thermodynamic variable. So we already said delta G. This is free energy. And this tells us if a reaction is spontaneous or not spontaneous. So a spontaneous reaction would have a delta G that is less than zero or negative. We would also call this a favorable reaction. A delta G that is non-spontaneous going to be positive, greater than zero, we would call this unfavorable. And like we said in chapter one, oftentimes these favorable and unfavorable reactions are coupled together to be able to achieve a unfavorable process. So the formula that we will use a different uh, form of, but the most common version is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So there's delta G, so the overall free energy equals delta H, so remember what delta H is, delta H is enthalpy. We also talk about this as the heat of the reaction. Um, this is usually in units of kilojoules per mole. Delta G is also in a unit of kilojoules per mole. <clears throat> minus T, T is temperature. Temperature has to be in a unit of Kelvin. And then delta S is entropy. And entropy has to do with how dispersed energy is. So the more spread out it is, the higher the entropy. The less spread out it is, the lower the entropy. Entropy is in a unit of joules per mole Kelvin. So this Kelvin here, this is why temperature needs to be in Kelvin. <clears throat> 
So there's lots of tables that talk about when reactions are spontaneous or not spontaneous. So it has to do with the sign of the enthalpy, the sign of the entropy, and then um, at some times a reaction can be favorable or unfavorable ba favorable based on the temperature. So this is all reviewed in this chapter. This is all stuff that we covered in general chemistry. And this is kind of the basis um, of where we'll be starting when we look at how thermodynamics are working in living cells. So something that's really important that I mentioned earlier is that living cells are not at equilibrium. The only time a living cell would be at equilibrium is if it was dead. It would be no longer living. So living cells are not at equilibrium. There is a term that we use, which I also mentioned earlier, um, to describe how living cells like to stay within a certain range of whatever variable we're talking about. That's called homeostasis. Homeostasis is not equilibrium. And we'll talk about that later. So remember when we're talking about equilibrium, we would use the equilibrium constant, K. Well, we can't use the equilibrium constant because we're not at equilibrium. So when we use, um, when we're talking about living cells and we're doing thermodynamic calculations, we have to use Q because remember Q is a reaction quotient It's the concentration of product over the concentration of reactant at some point that is not equilibrium. Also remember when you're writing reaction quotients and we're talking about reactions that are existing in both a forward and backward direction and you're writing the, equal, the reaction quotient, remember coefficients become exponents in this quotient expression. And also solids and liquids, which are pure substances, are not included. Sometimes you might see them represented with just a one, but remember they're not included in the reaction quotient or the equilibrium expression, but we're not, we're not talking about equilibrium expression, just reaction quotient. Okay, so let's look at what an example of a formula like this would look like. So we have um, what's called delta G naught prime. This is called the standard free energy. So standard free energy, remember when we have that little degree sign, this means at standard conditions. Remember standard conditions are one atmosphere of pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, and one molar concentrations. So this is not, these standard conditions, these are not going to be living conditions. So we'll be given a standard free energy for a specific chemical equation, but that's not the actual free energy when we're in a living system. So because of that, we need a formula that kind of brings it all together. So what it is, is delta G, which is the free energy of the reaction in a living cell. So this is the actual free energy. in a living system, I'll just say, it doesn't have to be in a cell, equals the standard free energy, delta G naught prime. So this would be like what you would look up in a textbook for a chemical reaction, but that is at standard conditions and these living systems are not gonna be in standard conditions. This is usually given to you. 
This would be given to you in the problem. This would be something you would look up. It's known. It's the free energy of a reaction at one atmosphere of pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, and one molar concentration. So this is something, a standard. This is something that you look up. That's why it's called the standard free energy. So now plus RT natural log of Q. So this is the formula that you would use to get the actual free energy of something living. So remember R is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. T is the temperature. Because my unit of R is Kelvin, temperature is Kelvin. And then Q, this is my reaction quotient, which is concentration of products over concentration of reactants. So this is the formula that we will use to calculate free energy of living systems. So let's look at an example. So I'm going to say you're studying a new enzyme that you've called ATP pyrophosphatase phosphatase and it catalyzes the following reaction so that part isn't necessarily important but ATP plus two water is in equilibrium with a MP plus two PI. PI is what we call inorganic phosphate. So this ATP is going to lose two phosphate molecules. So this is really PO4, two minus. In biochemistry, we call phosphate We call this PI for inorganic phosphate. Same thing, PO4, 3 minus. Inorganic phosphate. <clears throat> so this is the reaction that's being catalyzed. And you are given the standard free energy as negative 63 kilojoules per mole. So here's the question. If the concentration of AMP equals five nanomolar and the concentration of PI, inorganic phosphate, equals 0.1 micromolar and ATP is 5 picomolar, what is the delta G at 25 degrees Celsius? So we're going to use this equation for that. So a few things to pay attention to is that in this reaction up here, R is in joules per mole, um, and that needs to be the same as the unit of energy in the standard free energy that was given to us, which was kilojoules. So we have joules here and kilojoules here. I'm just gonna convert this to joules and then my answer will be in joules. I'll convert it back to kilojoules. You could convert this to kilojoules or this to joules either way. Just make sure that you are um, converting one or the other. Delta G is usually given in kilojoules per mole. So I'm gonna put it in kilojoules per mole at the end. Okay, so I'm going to say uh, delta G, which is what I'm solving for, equals the standard free energy, negative 63, I'm going to say negative 63,000 
joules per mole, because I converted it to joules, plus R, 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin, times the temperature in Kelvin, 25 degrees Celsius. The conversion between Celsius and Kelvin is you add 273. So this is gonna be 298K times the natural log of Q. I am going to put that down here, Q, just because I'm out of space. So what Q is, is it's the concentration of the products. These over here are products over the concentration of the reactants. These over here are reactants. Remember the rules. We're not at equilibrium, coefficients become exponents, and solids and liquids are not included. You'll notice there was no concentration of water given because water is a pure liquid. So it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be included here anyways. The rest of these are aqueous. Okay, so now let's write the Q down here. So concentration of products, so AMP is five nanomolar, so that's five times 10 to the negative ninth molar. times the inorganic phosphate, which is 0.1 micromolar. So I'm gonna say one times 10 to the negative seventh molar squared. It's squared because I have two of them. So if I have two of them, then that means this is squared, this term over the concentration of the reactants, ATP, I have five picomolar. So this is gonna be five, point, five times 10 to the negative 12th molar. Okay, so when you plug all of this in and then you convert it back to kilojoules, you should get something like delta G equals negative 125.7 kilojoules per mole. So there could be questions like, is this a favorable or unfavorable reaction? This would be a favorable reaction because it has a negative delta G, which is a spontaneous reaction. Things where people make mistakes here are not converting units and also forgetting to include coefficients as exponents.